1967, Bob Snow sold his Porsche Roadster and combined the profits with his last pilot's paycheck from the U.S. Navy. With nothing more than those proceeds and a love of Dixieland music, Bob Snow opened Rosie O'Grady's in Pensacola, Florida. The year was 1967. Years later, at the urging of a friend, he scouted locations for a new Rosie O'Grady's in Orlando. After two days with no prospects, he was in a cab on the way to the airport when he asked the driver if there was anything historic in Orlando. Not thinking there was much, the driver noted, we've got an old train station on Church Street. Even though he was minutes from the airport, Bob insisted they turn back so he could see the station. He kept the meter running for an hour and a half as he examined the old Victorian building, which opened in 1890 but hadn't seen passengers since 1920. Bob knew it was something special. On July 24, 1974, Rosie O'Grady's Good Time Emporium opened for business at Church Street Station in Orlando. Church Street Station was a success from the start, causing a revitalization of downtown Orlando and making it a destination on its own. At its peak, Church Street Station was bringing in 3.5 million visitors to downtown Orlando. Michael Eisner, fresh into his promise to create the Disney Decade, saw this success and saw his guests leaving Walt Disney World's bubble and venturing downtown to enjoy Dixieland jazz, top-notch dining, live music and dancing, and said basically, I want that. Thus, Pleasure Island was born. Pleasure Island is unlike any other island you've ever visited. This is an oasis of seven nightclubs, restaurants, and stores. These aren't your average establishments. Welcome to clubbing Disney style. This is the Adventures Club. Here you're surrounded by authentic 1930s paraphernalia and are treated to unique experiences like a mask room. <laughs> Down the street, there's the Zephyr Rock and Roller Drome, where you'll find live bands, food and drink, and a roller skating rink. Is this direct competition to Church Street Station? No, I don't think Disney ever thinks about competing with anybody. <laughs> An army of workers is sprucing Pleasure Island up for tonight's extravaganza, but most of the public won't get to come to the island till mid-May. If Pleasure Island becomes a success, and Disney believes it will, you may see more of these complexes throughout the country. Wendy Chioji, New Center 2, Pleasure Island. Well, now you got into this mess by going down a waterfall. Now, how would you suppose we'd get them out of there? By going up the waterfall. That's right. Anything's possible in Disneyland. <laughs> Welcome to this episode of Up the Waterfall with your hosts, Zana and Scott Otis. Hello, everyone. Where we share a journey of Disney history, parks, resorts, entertainment, all that fun stuff. That's right. And uh, it's been a bit, but we're back <laughs> and better than ever. This yes. is the podcast. It's so nice. We recorded it twice. <laughs> Uh, we're happy to be here and bring you a topic that's near and dear to our hearts. I've wanted to do this um, since before we did our last episode yeah. on Frontierland. Uh, it's just been a while since we gathered all of our research materials mm -hmm. and got our timing right. Uh, but here we are exploring Pleasure Island. That's right. Its origins and what happened to it. Yeah, that's right. And the history of all of the clubs and everything. Yeah. And I wanted to start with the Rosie O'Grady's Church Street Station background because really that is the origins Absolutely. of it wasn't on anyone's mind until Rosie O'Grady's and Church Street Station became such a success. Um, and of course, you know, Michael Eisner did not want people to leave Walt Disney World. <laughs> Michael so. Eisner being who he is. Yep. Exactly. Um, so we thought we'd just take a stroll down memory lane, as it were, uh, to talk about how Pleasure Island came to be, what the different clubs were, mm -hmm. and of course, a very important part of this is the backstory Oh yes, of Pleasure Island. <laughs> the very creative and interesting backstory. Yes. Um, I, we mentioned this in one of our episodes or live shows, but around the time that uh, Epcot was doing its live entertainment, like the 
in Italy and England, oh, right, right. the UK pavilion, they had those live uh, improv mm-hmm. shows. Those people came from basically the SAC Comedy Theater in downtown Orlando. They sure did. And then when Michael Eisner wanted to build Disney MGM Studios, he pulled those guys and basically made a lot of them Imagineers. Yeah, essentially had them cr- create the little backstory that, that yeah. goes along with so they had worked on creating Streetmosphere at MGM Studios, and then it was just a natural um, pick to choose them to create the backstory of Pleasure Island because nothing at Disney can exist without a backstory. That's how Disney is. Yes. That's right. It's all story all the time. It really was a different time. Um, Rosie O'Grady's, Bob Snow is quoted as saying that Rosie O'Grady's mm-hmm. could not exist today. And I think that's very true because it just came around at the time when like malls were just oh, becoming yeah. <laughs> a huge American pastime. It was just going to the mall and hanging out at the mall. So creating a place where everything was in one spot and you didn't have to drive all over Orlando to get to different places to enjoy music or dining or whatever. It was all just one place, which was genius and I don't think it would happen today because the world is just so different malls aren't really a place that people hang out anymore not (laughs) Not that this was a mall per se but it it was just like the idea of like oh there's something for everyone here Um, and I think now as is evidenced by the current state of Disney Springs what people want is like third party vendors <laughs> I don't know if it's what they want or they want it because Disney gave it to them and we'll That's talk about debate. that certainly with the history um, of uh, of what happened on the island yeah exactly but I just think it was just the perfect storm of uh, American you know what people wanted and what was at Rosie O'Grady's yeah. and for a while it did work at Pleasure Island as well that's right um, I was going to say, uh, Michael Eisner, he announced uh, Pleasure Island on July 21st, 1986, aboard the Empress Lily over there at the uh, Marketplace. And uh, they began construction in August of 86. And then um, it was actually inspired by an existing island over in Vancouver, Canada, Granville Island, right. which is kind of its own little, uh, it, it kind of evolved from, um, st- you know, street markets and things yeah. like that. Uh, Um, into clubs and things like that, too. Yeah. I mean, thinking about that kind of thing, I'm thinking of Faneuil Hall in Boston. Oh, yeah. Which is not the same scale as something like Rosie O'Grady's. They're very small little places, but there's like food stall kind of things and table service Mm -hmm. dining on like the ends, and there's always live music playing and things like that. I mean, that certainly has stood the test of time, but (laughs) it's like a very touristy place to go, and there's no cover charge to get in anywhere, so... Yeah, and and so just like Granville Island or in Vancouver, which is literally an island that's just off of the uh, the coast, there just has a road that goes over. That's very similar to physically how Pleasure Island is as well. It is an island that literally is just kind of carved through by a canal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they added bridges and made it an island. Yeah. So why don't you give us uh, some of the unique story that the Imagineers created, and then I'll give you the. Um, kind of the history of that venue. Well, yes, there are plaques or there were plaques um, (laughs) all around in front of every single building, uh, including the AMC theaters, which I will get to. There were probably 20 plus of those, weren't there? Yeah, 26. And I will list them. I'm not going to read them all right now, but I will list them all in the blog post that will come out with this podcast uh but this was the main entrance plaque which was on the bridge by the ticket booths Mm -hmm. the ticket booths of course being former fort wilderness railroad cars that's right um which who knows where those are now probably in someone's backyard (laughs) i'm not sure (laughs) okay here's the entrance plaque on the bridge it says founded 1911 an unverifiable anecdotal purely subjective theoretical alleged purported history also ersatz which, if you don't know what that means, it's just completely made up. So they've covered themselves. They've, you know, that's their legal disclaimer that Imagineering none of this at its finest is real. Right there. Yes. A living monument to the wise fool, the mad visionary, the scoundrel, the scallywag, and the seeker of enjoyment. Meriwether Adam Pleasure, who purchased the island in 1911. Pleasure's profitable canvas manufacturing slash sale fabricating empire founded on this site provided him with the capital to indulge his lifelong interest in the exotic, the experimental, the unexplainable. 
known as the Grand Funmeister, <laughs> Pleasure disappeared during his 1941 circumnavigation of the Antarctic. His sons, Henry and Stuart, took over the island and Pleasure Enterprises. Their mismanagement led to bankruptcy in 1955. Hurricane Connie hit that same year and Pleasure Island was abandoned. In 1987, archaeologists uncovered the site and its remains, and a large-scale reclamation project was begun. In 1989, the new Pleasure Island was reopened and dedicated to the legacy of Meriwether Adam Pleasure. Fun for all and all for fun. <laughs> Placed here by the Pleasure Island Hysterical Society. That's right. Yeah. Not historical. That's awesome. Yeah, um, yeah, Pleasure Island opened right there on uh, May 1st, 1989. Uh, pretty much the, was the same day as the Disney MGM Studios. Yes, and when we were planning to have this podcast <laughs> to coincide <laughs> with that, but that didn't really happen. That's okay. Um, what I love about this welcome plaque is there's a lot of information it really like, is a there's lot of so nonsensical much information backstory that you're just like what huh like sail making what yeah that, which is never really explained but that's like why sail making who knows <laughs> so i with that i will jump into yeah let's go through all of the different clubs the clubs and then i'll give in a description of what happened with those clubs yes so first up is the neon armadillo which was originally called the Greenhouse in 1927, constructed to house the vast array of exotic desert plants co collected by the island founder, a globetrotter and amateur cactogist. <laughs> yep. Correct me mm -hmm. if I'm wrong. Meriwether Pleasure. Pleasure regarded the Greenhouse as his personal Eden. He nurtured his prickly pals, as he called them, with fanatical devotion. After Pleasure's disappearance in 1941, his greenhouse was sealed off. When it was reopened in 1989, scientists discovered a huge and happy family of armadillos. The inhabitants were immortalized in neon by the island renovators. That's right. And so, yeah, this is the neon armadillo where uh, Maria and Enzo's now is located. Mm. Um, and actually, at that time, it was sh kind of shaped to look similar to a greenhouse, just like you were talking about. Uh, neon armadillo, of course, uh, opened in 1989 as a country uh, western music uh, location with a southwestern decor. Um, they actually had a countdown at the Neon Armadillo show with the Neon Armadillo dancers that at one point was syndicated by uh, in, on syndicated <laughs> TV back in the years 1993 and 1994. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, um, that was a country western bar all the way through uh, 1998. And then on um, June 10th, 1998, actually the BET Soundstage Club opened in its place, which is named after the BET channel. Mm-hmm on television who played R&B and hip hop and rap music, but, but family friendly. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, and it was kind of like guests that <clears throat> stepped into a Planet Groove, which was a TV show that was on uh, BET. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, with lots of video screens, um, roving cameras and um, wandering hosts and DJs. And actually served Caribbean style finger foods. And, and of course it had a, a giant bar as well that <laughs> served lots of drinks. <laughs> It was so quite an interesting uh, transformation right yeah, there. Yeah, it was a big time for um, handheld closed circuit camera oh, yeah. displaying on TV kind of things. Like that's, that's right. how they did the countdown every night, which we'll get into that um, mm -hmm. later. But yeah, very, very 80s, you know, very oh, late yeah. 80s. But back when it was the Neon Armadillo, they actually had um, some little signs made out of neon with a little armadillo. Right. Those were like the actual armadillos. They That's made right. them into neon. It said they were <laughs> immortalized. <laughs> All right. Next up is the Comedy Warehouse. This was actually the power station um, from 1912. I believe this is one of the oldest buildings, um, you know, in theory. Mm -hmm. uh, this building became a storage facility when Pleasure Island was electrified in 1928. Six years later, the power station became home to the Pleasure Island Thespian Players, founded by and featuring Isabella Pleasure, wife and of island founder and drama enthusiast Meriwether Pleasure. The players specialized in elaborate Central Florida historical pageants, including the Seminole Song of the Seminole. After Mrs. Pleasure's death in 1949, the building was closed and the players disbanded. Since its restoration by the Walt Disney Company, this site is again 
a warehouse storing strange notions, again, attractions and ideas slightly ahead of its time. Yeah. Yeah, this is, so this is, you know, one of the more popular of the clubs, the Comedy Warehouse. This is currently or where STK, the steakhouse, is yes, now. But it um, was bulldozed before that happened. Oh, of course. <laughs> um, but I was just kind of giving you an, a proximity of where yes. it was located. Wayfinding. Um, but so this was an interesting thing. It was kind of... Um, it was full of Disney props and and signs all over the walls, kind of like a storage facility uh, for all of those things. It, it kind of was um, shaped like a like a lecture hall in uh, like in, in a college with a little amphitheater, with pretty steep, uh, mm, like stadium seating. Like, exactly, like stadium seating, um, where they had a stage down there, and they did a lots of improv, and they they did some stand up comedy as well. But there was a, a famous uh, thing called Forbidden Disney, where That's they kind right. of made fun of the uh, you know poked fun at all of the Disney kind of tourist tropes and, and yes. stereotypes. That was based on Forbidden Broadway, which is a thing if you've ever been oh, to a right. place that sh- does Broadway shows, if it's a big enough area, because New York obviously has it, but um, Boston, I saw Forbidden Broadway in Boston, okay. and they kind of just poke fun and lampoon whatever the most popular musicals of the time are. So yes. it's So funny. if you can imagine, of course, uh, them yeah. kind of poking fun at the typical Disney tourists. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they had a lot of fun with that. Imagine uh, that today with like <laughs> live streamers and vloggers and... yeah. <laughs> so, they, so they would have like anywhere between four to six shows a night and people would line up in front of the club up uh, on the top of the hill. You would uh, enter, be seated, um, enjoy the show, and then the, all of the exits would be at the bottom of the stage mm. so that they would have room for more people um, Brilliant. who were waiting in line. Um, but yeah, they had all... And you can actually go on YouTube and see some old uh, shows YouTube. of the four Forbidden Disney. It's very interesting to see. Really? Oh, I haven't oh, yeah. looked that up. I'll have to do that. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, the Comedy Warehouse has like reemerged over oh, the yeah. years a couple of times after Pleasure Island was long gone. They did... Um, because a lot of those people were also from the SAC Comedy Warehouse or whatever right. it's called, theater... Uh, so they did a few over at the Hollywood Studios. Yeah, they did it like uh, during the holidays. They would kind of have like uh, holiday themed uh, improv yeah. shows at the studios. They had one over at the Premier Theater, I think it's called, mm-hmm. where they used to hold the Star Wars saga That's right. thing. And then they did another one over at the former Sounds Dangerous Monster, Monster Sound, Sound Show, Show right. which is now... <laughs> A Mickey Short mm-hmm. place, which I don't Mickey Shorts, yeah. remember the name of the short that's there. So that's fun. <laughs> you can check that out. Anyway, I'm sure that it will reappear over time if they can get those oh, people yeah. together. Oh, yeah, because they, they, they're still yeah, around. Yeah, people love that, especially people that have been there from the start and know those original players. That's right. Next up is the Videopolis East, yeah. which implies that there was a Videopolis West. And there was. Which you know all about because it was actually in Disneyland. Yeah, it opened in Disneyland uh, just to the left of the It's a Small World. It's that th- oh, right. um, where, where that theater. Mickey where and the, the Magical Map yep. is now. That, that was. was the original venue uh, from that. It opened there in 1985. It's kind of like a dance club for just kind of young yeah, teens. Trying to keep up with the times. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was the original Videopolis and then they brought uh, Videopolis East. So why don't you tell us? Okay. Well, this was plaque. actually, according to the plaque, the Artificial Intelligence Lab built in 1929 and uh, built for island founder Meriwether Pleasure's son, Henry, the mad genius of Lake Buena Vista, and Henry's life work, the Pleasure Cellular Automaton. <laughs> that sounds terrible, but okay. <laughs> Henry died thinking his experiments in artificial intelligence had failed. But when the building was reopened in 1987, the automaton was alive and thriving. In fact, it directed the refurbishing of its home and designed the sophisticated (laughs) computer hardware that shows itself to its best advantage. The complete and purely subjective saga of Pleasure Island is synthesized on the ersatz hysterical plaques at the island's entrance. So some of the plaques are now having these little... 
mm-hmm. blurbs at the bottom to tell you like, hey, you should go look for other plaques because there's more to this story. That's right. If you're confused. <laughs> so yeah, Videopolis East is uh, kind of, um, it was where now in between the SDK Steakhouse and kind of like where the ganachery is. Now. Oh, okay. Um, Oh, uh, yeah, because it later became The Cage, which you'll get right. into. That's what uh, I remember. So it opened, being. yes, as Videopolis East, which actually had a strict age policy where you could only be 21 and under. Under. Unlike some of the other clubs, which was 21 and over, this one was, you had to be 21 or under to be able to enter. Mm. Um, but the Videopolis East did not last uh, about a year, yeah. from opening in 1989 through 1990. And then in the year 1990, yes, it did transform to The Cage, uh, which played um, music videos over like 170 different monitors all throughout uh, the mm. club, um, which they actually did also have that in Videopolis East as well. It was kind of like alternative music, from what I recall. Right. Like what I was listening to at the time. But I was kind of afraid <laughs> to go in because I was not a club person. Right. So I didn't go until it changed again. Yes, in 1992. So that only lasted maybe about two years. And then it changed to eight tracks, which was, of course, you know, celebrating the 70s and 80s yeah. uh, music. For all the oldsters that, you know, for our time, the people that were older than us. And it was that <laughs> all the way through uh, throughout the existence of Pleasure Island through 2008. Wow. Very fun. Okay. Uh, but all of those, like everything on that side was completely raised, correct? Oh, yeah. Completely. Okay. Well, except for the next one that we're talking about. Oh, here. what's the next one? Hold on. I have to find it. Mannequin's in Dance Palace. Oh, that's right. Yes. Okay. That brings us to Mannequin's Dance Palace. Um, built in 1912. This is another. There's a few 1912 ones, so never mind about my earliest <laughs> building. Uh, Pleasure Island Canvas Works Fabrication Plant from 1912. Second building erected on the island. This actually housed Meriwether Pleasure's famous canvas fabrication works. In the 1930s, it was converted to a soundstage for Invincible Pictures, then into a design studio and workshop for various pleasure projects. Most notable of these was a huge locomotive powered by a combination of steam and magnetic power. The, a colossal turntable was installed to facilitate the work on this revolutionary product called Maxwell's Demon. Oh, my. That's a very obscure Disney <laughs> reference. Like, that's a good trivia question. Um, that was intended to revolutionize world transportation. It didn't. Oh. For further information, <laughs> for further unverifiable information on the life and times of Pleasure Island, refer to the theoretical hysterical plaques located at the island's entrances. So yeah, Mannequin's Dance Palace. This one was uh, pretty crazy. This is uh, this was where Morimoto Asia is now. Yes. Um, but it was um, three stories. It was three stories. Which, you actually, well, if you go into Morimoto, you can see that yeah. it still like goes up. You would uh, begin by entering an elevator that took you to the third floor, and you would come out of the elevator, and you'd kind of have to make your way down wow. to the dance floor, uh, which was, as you said, a giant turntable. Um, this dance place only was actually also had a strict age policy, 21 and up. And it had, you know, just thumping techno uh, music (laughs) with lots of dancers, actually live dancers, and actual mannequins kind of spread throughout the place as well with an amazing light display as well. Um, And it rotated. Yeah. So yeah, on the, on the dance floor. Yeah, the dance floor, as I mentioned, yeah, was a giant turntable that rotated very that slowly. Was, yeah, that was where also I believe the curfew busters dancers were, which oh, yeah. would happen towards <laughs> the end of the night, right before they would do the um, countdown, the countdown, and they would get New people Eve, all right. hyped up to you know go beyond their curfew and <laughs> and welcome in the new year. Um, lots of crazy. Yeah. dancers and actual mannequins as you said in there mm-hmm. i remember going in there much later on like very close to pleasure island closing and it was a very sad experience <laughs> because i walked in there and there was like Aww. literally two people <laughs> oh, on the no. dance floor like that was slowly rotating wow. and i was like ooh, yeah the couple of times a time. couple of times i went and it was you know at its at its heyday you yeah know, where you know lots of a lot of people, a lot of dancing, yeah, a lot of thump, thump, thumping <laughs> music, a lot of fun. 
<sighs> well, if you have any memories of mannequins, be sure to let us know. Please. We'd love to hear them. Uh, that brings us to, which was kind of across the way from it, I believe, mm-hmm. the Rock and Roll Beach Club, uh, which opened up as Zephyr Rock and Roller Dome, a roller skating dance club. That's right. This was known as Building X and erected in 1937. Island founder and UFO enthusiast Meriwether Pleasure built his experimental X thing here. Pleasure himself designed this super amphibious aircraft that could harness the power of the wind. The X thing flew only once, September 1st, 1940, with Pleasure himself at the controls. The test flight is shrouded in mystery, but upon landing, Pleasure became began broadcasts to outer space. Beamed from the roof of this building, the international Morse code messages repeated W-E-L-C-O-M-E. <laughs> Further information on the incredible doings of Pleasure Island from 1911 to present day may be found inscribed on the quasi-historical plaques at all island entrances. Yeah. So yeah, the Zephyr Rock and Roller Dome. I mean, first off, with that story, you can see all of their uh, backstories are Getting kind of crazy, I would say. Meriwether Pleasure was involved in a lot of things. Yeah. So the Zephyr Rock and Roller Dome is kind of where uh, Jock Lindsay's hangar bar is now. Mm. Um, but yeah, this was a, it opened in 1989 as a combination dance club and roller skating rink, which you can imagine, hmm. Uh, but it started, also. this was also a three-story um, tall building. You would go up the stairs to the third floor and on the second floor is where they had the roller skating rink that just kind of went in uh, like an oval around the stage on the first floor they actually had an elevated dj over the dance floor that was um, suspended up there hmm. and as you can imagine the roller skating you know kind of <laughs> combined with the uh the alcohol yeah not that a good combo that didn't last and so uh, very shortly into that it turned into the zephyr uh, rock and Roll Beach Club, mm. where it uh, remained all the way through 2008, with it um, had its icon of kind of like a, a shark with a with sunglasses. Ah, uh, yes, that was its uh, mascot, if you will. Mm. But yeah, they played popular hits as well. Very fun. I'm not sure if I ever actually went in that one, but I, I do did. remember the outside of it. We'll get into me not going to Pleasure Island <laughs> a lot after I read all these plaques. Okay, this brings us to. Our, you know, this is the most famous and beloved and sorely missed club, of course, the Adventurers Club. Oh, yes. And according to the plaque, it was, this is actually the only one that the backstory coincides with the building itself. Like, it didn't have a different name. Like, this was the Adventurers Club. Mm -hmm. Founded in 1932, this imposing building was designed to house the personal, the huge personal library and archaeological trophy collection of island founder and compulsive explorer Meriwether Adam Pleasure. Pleasure won the plans in a game of dominoes and attributed them (laughs) throughout his life to noted architects Sir Edwin Lutons, Charles Rennie McIntosh, and Eliel Sarian. I don't know if these are like real people. I have not done that research. (laughs) Perhaps they're just anagrams of other people's names or something or just friends. The building became the headquarters for the Adventurers Club, Pleasure's zany band of globetrotting friends. Exotic souvenirs of the members' outlandish expeditions and riotous adventures were displayed on the walls. After Pleasure vanished at sea in 1941, the club was sealed until it was open to the public for the first time in 1989. Yeah, so yeah, this is the Adventurers Club, the most famous one. Uh, This was right across the street from uh, the Comedy Warehouse. This is uh, essentially where the Edison is now. Um, Once again, you'd entered on the top floor, and uh, you could kind of see the gallery below once you entered, and eventually, you know, there was a stairway in the back. You'd work your way over there and go down into the uh, gallery floor. Um, where they just had all kinds of crazy antics and the whole, you know, every square inch of the walls was covered with some, some exotic, uh, collections. You know, if you can imagine, you know, this is Joe Rohde's baby. So, uh, it yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> and yeah. he's a member of the real Adventurers Club. That's, that's that, right. Whatever that's called, the Explorers Club. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. They had that, and the you know, there was a, a, a giant statue right in the middle of the floor of a guy fishing. Uh, there was the 
who is it? The general or or the, the admiral? Colonel? Uh, the colonel. Wow. You colonel know, who's Critchlow <laughs> Suchbench. <laughs> yes. The club glee meister. <laughs> exactly. Who would uh, ha- <clears throat> you know? They would have all kinds of things, including the adventurers' creed that they would uh, say oh, every now and again, which creed? was yes. We climb the highest mountains just to get a better view. We plumb the deepest oceans because we're dancing, or sorry, daring through and through. <laughs> <laughs> we, cr- we cross the scorching desert, martinis in our hand. We ski the polar ice cap in tuxedo looking grand. We're reckless, brave, and loyal, and valiant to the end. If you come and hear a stranger, you'll exit as a friend. Very good. Yeah. So there are you know people that they came to this and you know they got all into you know all of the backstory and all of the uh, the antics yeah, that were going I, on throughout. I feel like this in and of itself is like another entire podcast oh, yeah. because there's just so many layers to it. There's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine regular resident adventurer characters, mm-hmm. um, and we would be doing a disservice to. <laughs> You know, not go into all of that uh, talking about the Adventures Club. But because we're talking about Pleasure Island in general, you know, we will save that for another podcast. Yeah. But needless to say, it is very beloved. The characters, as I said, were like regulars. Um, the performers got to know guests and guests got to know the performers. And some of them are still at Disney today yeah. doing, you know, special events and things like that. Um, I mean, they even had a newsletter, like an yeah. online newsletter that people would, uh, I'm not sure if it was online or if it was actual printed, um, but yeah, where they would just kind of have regular updates with like all kinds of articles with all, um, you know, nonsensical stories Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, with these the... adventurers. And of course, you know, this is uh, essentially the beginning of the Society of Explorers and Adventurers. That's you know, right. The SEA. Well, that's right. Another which, podcast in and of itself, <laughs> which maybe we'll do a series and lead into that. But That's right. Uh, Dis- Destination D, Attraction Rewind in 2014, did a tribute to Pleasure Island and brought back the Adventurers Club for one night. Mm-hmm. Um, we got to experience that. You and I, we never really were Adventurers Club yeah. people. I mean, I went there a couple of times, yeah. and I enjoyed, you know, going to all the different rooms and, and seeing the little shows that they had there, and like the mask room and the trophy room and then the library and the shows that they would perform there. But, yeah, I was not a regular yeah. where, you know, where I enjoyed the legacy and the lore that a lot of people really got into. I feel like now I would be very into oh, it. Yeah. But at the time, I was you know in my <laughs> 20s and i'm i'm still not really about like audience participation things right. and that's what mm-hmm. i was always worried about going in there i was like i don't want anyone to call on me i don't want to be a part of this but i just want to fun observe just to observe yeah but now <laughs> i still don't like that but i think i would i'm much more interested in the backstory and yeah. being you know an adult and knowing not that i wasn't an adult before <laughs> you know what i mean but knowing a lot of um, the cast members involved in it over the years and seeing them at different events and things yeah. like that, I think I would appreciate it. Yeah, it would have been more. fun to have gone there often and just kind of see how the story evolved over yeah, the years. Exactly. Yeah, that and would have been fun. There are, you know, YouTube videos of various oh, yes. performances at the Adventures Club. So be sure to watch those mm-hmm. if you have not seen it yourself. Um, again, if you have fun stories of the Adventures Club, let us know. We'd love to hear them. And there are actually a couple other venues that you know, didn't open with clubs, but then later became clubs. And so you want to go into those as well? Sure. That was a great segue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would bring us to the fireworks factory. This was actually a design that was originally meant for Discovery Bay at uh, Disneyland. You know, mm-hmm. Tony Baxter's baby that oh, yes. uh, never really came to be. Um, but yeah, they opened it here as part of um, the Pleasure Island. And it was just a very typical restaurant i think you had been there many times right oh my gosh pleasure uh pleasure island fireworks factory was our (laughs) go-to restaurant in like that area pleasure island disney village marketplace uh we i mean it it wasn't anything to write home about it was literally like a tgi fridays like like just very american chilies restaurant it did have a lot of uh you know fireworks uh, paraphernalia throughout but but 
because it was a levy restaurant yeah it was that was the theming was all disney and the the food was all levy. not that there's anything against levy restaurants but it was just very you mm-hmm. know stuff you would find at any chain restaurant exactly. but we did enjoy it and i remember my mother getting ribs all the time there so <laughs> they did have good ribs barbecue ribs and i still have matches from the fireworks factory oh, cool. in my disney oh, matchbook collection that's actually kind of ironic isn't it though i didn't burn anything down with them all right well next up is again not a club but merriweather's market which was originally like a food court area mm-hmm. i guess right. i don't have any memory of ever going I, there i do i loved food courts at this <laughs> <time>. <laughs> um now mm-hmm. the reason we're covering that is of course later it became raglan road raglan road so this was their first um time where they had gone in and essentially had an outside vendor come yeah, in and a third party. become a restaurant. And so the Disney kind of realized, hey, wait a minute. We can collect rent and a yeah. lot of rent. And so this kind of became the beginning of essentially the end of Pleasure Island yeah. and to what it is now where there are many, many restaurants and things mm-hmm. uh, run by different companies. Yeah. I feel like we should also mention um, the West End Oh yeah, stage. that's right. Yeah, so on the so they had all of these clubs where you would go inside, uh, but on the end, in between the what was the Neon Armadillo and the Comedy Warehouse, or later the BET Soundstage and the Comedy Warehouse, there was the West End Stage, which was essentially on the top of the hill. This was kind of like where that bridge that goes down to um, to the west side yeah. is. Now. <laughs> west side. This, of course, was like. Frankie, Frankie and the, and the West, West End, End Boys, Boys was a yeah popular uh, band that played there, and of course it was also the venue where they where every night they had the um, the countdown yeah. for the New Year's Eve countdown that where they shot off fireworks from the roof of the um, of the Adventures Club. Yeah, and there was confetti cannons oh, yeah. and lots and they of did that every single night. Yeah, and the countdown leading up to you know the f- stroke of midnight there was lots of video screens it would be like a 15 minute countdown yeah right? and they would have they would check in with all the clubs and people would be in the clubs <laughs> and they're like yes we're here at the you know neon armadillo or whatever um and they would show people so people loved being on oh, tv yeah. and so they would love seeing themselves on the big screen or on the little screens in the various clubs and they would go to each club and do the countdown and then you know everyone would count down together yeah. so you didn't have to be outside of a club to experience uh new year's eve That's every right. night and it was a big you know it selling a, point and what's funny is if you compare it to kind of like what is now new year's eve at like epcot or anything like that <laughs> yeah. it was pretty paltry but you know exactly. for the you know for its location it was you know they they had a, a huge countdown and a, yeah. a lot of his pizzazz that went with that and I think part of what made Frankie and the West End Boys popular is the locals and the oh, cast yeah. members, sure. which, you know, every Thursday was cast member <laughs> discount night. And uh, that's when people went and really, you know, everyone knew everybody and it was a big yeah. rollicking good time if you were into that sort of thing back then, which I was, <laughs> I think I was just like a little too young and afraid to get drunk a lot because i was 21 but i have always been like you know i don't want to lose control of my faculties and i need to be in control um so i was not a big club person i was not a big drinker so it never like occurred to me to spend money to go to pleasure island because of that i did go a couple of times and i remember there being like a big cauldron type thing oh on like the corner of the main walkway and people were like pouring out drinks into cups Yikes. and I was just like ah. I was very you know yeah. sheltered I guess <laughs> and as someone who doesn't drink yeah I I, I only went there a few times but uh, I, I was able to f- find ways to have fun yeah. you know going to places like the Adventures Club and the Comedy Warehouse mostly yeah. and also I you know it wasn't like I didn't have cast member friends to go hang out with right. but we worked on main street usa <laughs> and by the time we were done with our shifts it was usually like pleasure island was closed yeah, so it, we hung it, out it at perkins at, at 2 a.m at yeah. crossroads and we would eat breakfast at 2 a.m oh. and then i would go home so that was my exciting night and i as a result <laughs> i didn't really appreciate um pleasure island as much yeah, as it wasn't others as easy to. we should talk about um the the admission policy yeah so it started out having uh, a cover charge 
mm-hmm. which is why they had the ticket booths in the front, yeah. if you recall, the little former Fort Wilderness Railroad uh, booths, the little booths, cars. Cars, thank you. <laughs> I couldn't remember the name of that. And you would buy your ticket, and there was turnstiles, and you would go across the bridge, um, kind of where Raglan Road is mm-hmm. now, and start your experience. And then you could get into all the clubs and yeah, but, dine the, and but shop. later they opened the West Side. Which was, you know, it was a very oddly shaped complex. It basically yeah. had, you had the marketplace on one side, west side on the other, with Pleasure Island in the middle. Mm-hmm. And in order to get from one to the other, you had to walk through it. Yeah. Uh, so that eventually they kind of opened it up where you could just walk through Pleasure Island. Um, and so they, they charged per club. You could either get a one club uh, ticket mm-hmm. or a ticket for all of the clubs. Um, but... but when Pleasure Island was open, you know, in the middle, like towards the, in the evening, yeah. and you had families kind of walking from one to the other, it became a very odd mix yes. to be able to, you know, to dragging <coughs> your children from one side to the other yeah. through this um, lot of lot of music <laughs> and drinking. So it's a very odd time. Yeah. So this all led to uh, the eventual demise and down, you know, yeah, and I think part of it was that they just didn't keep up with the times and yeah. people had moved on, you know, there was a whole world outside of Disney and going to Pleasure Island wasn't cool anymore. Right. <laughs> I mean, when in 2007 they announced that uh, it would be closing, of course, you know, the the, the loyal um, attendees of some of these places, especially... Um, the Adventures Club, oh, yes. you know, they came out in force Petitions and they and petitioned and they say, you know, we need to save Pleasure Island. I believe there was an actual Save Pleasure Island website, website as well. Yeah. Um, but no, it did not work. And slowly they demolished, I know, like the Zephyr uh, Rock and Roll Club got yeah. uh, torn down as well as, you know, um, Motion and all that area. And, and those places were sitting that way for quite some time uh, before they figured out what they were going to do. And slowly, you know, they would, they turned uh, certain places into, you know, these outside vendor eateries. Uh, But eventually, that's when they said, you know what, no, we're going to do Disney Springs instead. Yes, and that was in 2013, that announcement was made. Okay. And... It's there today. You can go see That's Disney right. Springs. I mean, Disney Springs is lovely. The actual springs themselves, which is kind of where the um, the canal is that separated Pleasure Island from the mainland. That's essentially kind of where uh, yeah. the actual springs is right now. And it really is beautiful. It really is. Yeah. Um, they almost did too good of a job in this <laughs> transformation because now it's like ridiculously busy at Disney Very Springs busy, all yes. the time. Even, you know, in these times uh, before recently when capacity was much lower, um, you could go to Disney Springs and it didn't seem like there was any capacity restrictions there. It's always so crowded now, unless you're there like right when they open on a weekday, perhaps. And it's so big because, you know, it took up what was the marketplace, which is still the marketplace, the West Side, which is still that, Um, you know, Pleasure Island became the landing. Mm -hmm. But then what was the... um, a lot of the parking lot that became more oh, yeah. of Disney Springs too. Yeah, they bumped it out. Yeah, so it's it's gigantic, and they just they've added so many things, so many restaurants, so many uh, yeah. shops and um, eateries as well. Yeah, they things. really did go all in on the restaurants. I don't think there's one <laughs> um, of the newer restaurants that they added that is not good. I mean, they all have yeah. great reputations for having great food, so they really chose wisely and the with the shopping they kind of just brought in what you would find at a mall we've come full circle to a mall and it's now um, a a, a pleasant outdoor mall yes with you know some of them are really high-end shops that you and i might not go to but um some tourists that come here from Mm -hmm. many other countries may not want to make a trek to the mall at millennia or the florida mall they can do all of their shopping here. So they they did it. They made Pleasure Island a success. They just took the clubs out. And they took the signs away yeah. and all of the plaques and the backstory. Exactly. But that's okay. 
I mean, we'll always have our memory. That's right. I don't have many memories, so I have a single <laughs> memory. Uh, but we thank you for listening, of course, and watching if you're watching us on the video and getting all of these fun uh, photos and ancient videos <laughs> that are probably not going to be the best quality, but you know, it was the 90s. What are you going to do? That's right. Giant handheld camcorders on your shoulder <laughs> recording. Thank goodness for those people that did that. Um, if you have any Pleasure Island tales that you'd like to share with us we would love to hear them oh yeah uh you can just send them to xana at xanaland.com and i will get them and read them on the show or you can that would be fun drop a comment uh yeah i'll read them on the live show oh that yes. would be fun because when this comes nights, out yeah. we can talk about the podcast on the live show mm -hmm. uh if all goes according to plan knock on wood maybe this time the recording will work <laughs> but we do thank you for watching uh, we will have another podcast it will not be four months in between <laughs> Uh, next time so stay tuned turn those notifications on subscribe yes um, and share please tell your friends as i've mentioned a few times there is a video version which will be the highlights version and then you can listen to the full version um on you know audio podcasts on apple or android wherever you listen to your podcast which you may be doing right now okay. so we do thank you for listening tell a friend if you enjoyed what you heard or saw and uh we will see you next time up the waterfall that's right